So why don't you guys open your Bibles, please. We are going to be stepping out of Genesis for the next five weeks. Uh, we just felt like it was timely. Um, it was something that would be good for our body to, to spend five weeks thinking about opening God's Word and seeing what it has to say about marriage, about marriage. Um, <clears throat> and so a couple, you know, a couple reasons for that are we are a really young church, right? We are, uh, our average age is far, far below the average age of churches in the United States. We've got a lot of young people that are thinking about marriage. We've got a lot of young married people, okay? And our culture is really loud about marriage. And so we want to come in and open God's word. And we just think that this relationship is so foundational, right? It, it is a pillar. It is a core of your life. You can have, I was just thinking, even as I was preparing, you might hear this twice, but I was thinking, even if you're, uh, you, you could have an, uh, the, your dream job. You could have the five best friends you've ever had in your life. You can have, um, you, you know, your, the greatest hobbies you've ever done. And if your marriage is a wreck, you know what I mean? You won't be, you're not a happy guy or girl. You know what I'm saying? Like it, you can have all these things going well for you. And if you come home and there's fighting and screaming and yelling and discord and lack of intimacy and lack of unity and lack of trust, um, it, you know, it's just, it's going to be a, a tough road to hoe. Okay, not to say that your marriage relationship is more important than um, our, our relationship with the Lord. Jesus says that we should love him more than our wives, but, um, but it's very important. It's foundational, right? And so we need to go and we need to address this. It's something that's important for us as a church. And so we're going to take five weeks. I know you guys were all itching to hear about Sodom and Gomorrah. I know, that, you're so disappointed. That, that's, <laughs> sorry to this point. All right, we're, we're getting into marriage. So please look at me at Matthew 19. And we're going to start in verse 1. We'll read it, and then we'll just ask the Lord to um, bless our time. It says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by saying, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read... That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Oh, but they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only to those, only those to whom it, was given, it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Would you bow your heads and ask the Lord to bless our time. God, we come before you and we open your word and we acknowledge that you are the God who speaks. Lord, that you spoke in the beginning and you made the earth. God, you spoke to the prophets. God, you spoke in many ways. Long times ago, you spoke to us through your son and now you speak to us through your word. And so, we're, we're, uh, Lord, we're, we just admit you're not the deist, far-off watchmaker God, but you know Vintage Faith Church. God, you know every man and woman in the room. God, you know what their marriage is like. You know what their life is like. You know what's going on. And Jesus, you speak to us this morning. And we believe uh, it's your providence that would have us uh, investigating this topic this morning. And we ask you to bless and to speak and to move. God, I ask for strong marriages. God, I ask you to humble us and that we would joyfully turn and repent and seek you with our whole lives. God, I pray for young people that are not yet married. Oh God, I just beg you, Lord, would you keep them, uh, would, you, would you give them wisdom? Please, Lord, give them wisdom to be wise in this uh, area of, your, of their lives, God. They're thinking about who to marry, when to marry, what to do, how to do it. Lord, I just beg you, would you give them wisdom from your word? I pray that they, you would give them a heart that just wants to submit to your word. Give them a heart that doesn't want to just do it their own way. It doesn't just want to go with what the world says. But Lord, I pray, please, God, would you give them a heart that is eager to submit to your wisdom? We love you, Father, and we ask you to bless now. We ask you to speak to us through your word. I, I need your help, God. I ask you to speak through me. We pray this in your name, and we love you. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I think one of the things that uh, probably would be wise for us to start with is um, it would be wise for us, I think, as a church to start with humbling ourselves and admitting that maybe we don't know everything there is to know about marriage. Maybe uh, it would be, I think it would be wise for us to start by humbling ourselves and saying, maybe just because, you know, we feel like we have a few things figured out, that, that maybe there's more that God has for us. The um, image that is coming to, was coming to my mind as I was thinking about this, and I'm, I'm hoping that the Lord will use in your heart to get you to lean in to what we're teaching this morning, is this uh, image of uh, the Israelites when they were coming back from Babylon to rebuild the temple. I don't know if you guys remember this story, but uh, I'll, just, I'll just run quickly through. Um, <clears throat> Solomon built the temple first, okay? He was the first one to build the temple, and it was just the mo- one of the most magnificent structures that's ever been built, okay? It was filled with gold. The glory of God literally came down and rested upon it. Um, it, it people were so wealthy in that time that they said silver wasn't worth anything, Okay, it, it would be like $5 bills on the ground and people are like, so what? what, what it doesn't even matter. Like people are so wealthy. Gold is so plentiful in Solomon's time because people just brought the wealth of the nations into Israel that silver was counted as nothing. Okay, it's this shocking amount of wealth. And then you go into the temple and everything's overlaid with gold. It's this uh, ornate, massive structure made by master craftsmen. The glory of God rests on it. There are pools of water that, that hold literally tons and tons of water outside of it. It is a shocking, shocking marvel of a place, okay? And then the people sin. They don't follow God. They don't love God. They're not faithful to the covenant of God, and God destroys it. And then once they're in uh, exile in Babylon, God prophesies through Haggai, through one of their prophets, and he says that you're going to go back and you're going to rebuild the temple. But he says something really fascinating. He says the the glory of the later temple is going to be greater than the glory of the former temple. Okay, the glory of the temple that you're going to go build is going to be even greater than the temple that Solomon built. And so he calls them to it. He says, stir up yourself. And so Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua and some, I think Joshua or Joseph, I always mix those two up, but uh, he stirs up the hearts of some men to go and to um, build this new temple. And it's really fascinating. You go and you read about it in Nehemiah. And as they're building the temple, um, they, they they, they lay the foundation for it. And two things happen. There's some young men and there's some old men, and they have a massively different response when they see the foundation laid. The young men, they look at the foundation and they worship. They say, yes. They, they, they've come from Babylon. God's brought them back through a miracle. And they see this temple and they're, they're, they're like, this is awesome. This is really, really amazing what God's doing here. But something else happens. The old men have the opposite reaction. They look at the foundation of the temple. And what the old men do is they start to weep. They start to weep. Do you know why they weep? They weep because they know the glory of the former temple. And when they see this temple, they're like, this is, this is, this is not even close. This is a, this is a joke. Of the t- this is, you know, they're, they're weeping because they know what it was like in Solomon's temple. And they see what this is going to be. They see their ragtag efforts. They see they lack the wealth to rebuild it uh, even close to the glory of Solomon, much less what Haggai said it would be like. And so they weep. And I think one of the things that we can be guilty of, especially, especially as young people, I think what we can be guilty of is we can look at uh, marriage today and we feel like if we know that marriage is between a man and a woman, we're like, yes, <laughs> I've got it figured out. Uh, look how glorious this is, right? The whole culture is falling apart. They don't even know what marriage is. And I know it's between a man and a woman. And so I rejoice. And what we've done is we, we lower the standard of what it is to such a degree that we build something that would cause people in the past, you go back 150, 200 years, and they see what marriage is like today, even in Christian marriages, and they, it, it would probably cause them to weep. It would probably, they know the profound intimacy that's possible. They know the profound joy of raising kids in the Lord and a strong marriage that's built on exclusivity, that's built on prominence, that's built on intimacy, that's built on seeking God and obeying God and walking in His ways. They know the incredible glory and beauty and wonder of marriage. And we're over here cheering ourselves on because we think we understand this much about it. And they, if they were able to see it, would would probably be tempted to weep if they saw our marriages and our homes and our churches. Does that make sense? And so that what's interesting about this prophet of Haggai is, was Haggai's prophecy false? 
Was he just wrong? Is he a false prophet? Well, if he's in the Bible, <laughs> you, can, you can guess he's probably not wrong, right? So what, did he, what was he getting at? Like, is there going to be another temple that's going to be built? What, what is going on here? Well, I think if you, if you go and you, you continue to read the New Testament, one of the themes that gets played out is God just, another temple does get built, okay? Herod builds another temple, and it's pretty tremendous. It's pretty glorious. I wouldn't say it's as glorious as Solomon's temple, but another temple does get built. Um, <clears throat> uh, but that temple, it gets destroyed by God in 70 AD. The temple is, is shut down. And I think one of the things that God is trying to communicate to us when uh, Titus, the Roman emperor, destroyed that is God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands and that the temple that's going to be more glorious even than Solomon's temple is the temple that he's building which is his church he is rebuilding the church right and and, and when that church comes in all of its fullness and all of its glory God is building it stone by stone on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and when we gather here as a church to study God's word what we're doing is we are building that temple we're doing the same things that Nehemiah and Ezra were doing. We're arm in arm and we're trying to build and layer and, and produce uh, this, this new temple of God where God dwells. The church is the dwelling place of God. The people of God are the dwelling place of God. And every time there's been a reformation and every time there's been a revival, one of the foundational things that people have had to change and repent of in their life is their marriages. You go and you study Ezra and Nehemiah, just like we've been talking about, and Ezra stands up to preach the law, and then after he stands up to preach the law, he goes and it says he weeps over their sin. What's the sin that he's weeping about? He's weeping over their marriages. He's weeping that they've married foreign women. He's weeping that they are not following and trusting and obeying and loving and serving God in the way that they ought to serve and love and trust him. And when God grants that reformation, when he grants that revival, here's what the heart of the people is. He stands up to preach the word and it says all the people gather in the courtyard. It says everybody who's old enough to understand gathers. Okay, so the idea there is children that are able, as soon as you're old enough to be able to understand, they're gathering there to hear what Ezra is saying. And the people literally listen to him reading from the Old Testament and teaching the law for four or five hours. You know what I mean? Like, can you imagine if I just opened up to Genesis? And I was like, all right, guys, let's go. Here we go. We're going to start. You, you know, and I just start to read the Old Testament. And it says he gives them the sense. It says there's people walking around explaining what this means and what that means. But he does that for hours. And here's what's fascinating about it. The people had a heart for it. Like the people actually wanted it. Why did the people want it so bad? It's because they had been in Babylon. They had seen what happens when you go away from God. They had seen what happens when you neglect obeying God and following God and just doing what he says. And they had this heart, okay, no more of that. I've seen what it's like to go my own way. I've seen what it's like to try to invent something for myself, to say this is what marriage is, this is how we should worship God, this is what we should do, to be flippant about the things of God. And it cost them everything, right? Like family members died. You know, horrible, like that beautiful, glorious temple was destroyed. They have to rebuild it at great sorrow, at great pain. And what it did is it inclined their hearts to say, okay, I'm done doing it my way. I just want to know what God says. And so almost every time there's a re reformation or a revival, you can even study this in the history of the church, what comes along with it is a renewed interest in what does God's word say. I don't want to do this my own way anymore. I don't want to try to just figure this out. I don't want to, I don't want to be, I, I, I'm too dumb. I can't figure it out. The culture is crazy. I, I just want to know, okay, God, what does your word say? And that's what I want to do. Does that make sense? And here's my prayer. My prayer is that we would humble ourselves as a church, whether you're married, whether you're not yet married, if you, if you don't think you're ever going to be married, if you used to be married, whatever it is, that we would humble ourselves and that we would have that same heart that just says, okay, what does God's word say? I just want, I want to do that. Not to have this idea that we've got it all figured out and we know what it is and what it's not and how we ought to live and how we ought to, but we would just say, oh, what does God's word say? We, we lean in and want to know. So look with me now at verse three. This seems to be what Jesus does. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So they're asking him a print, like how you should behave in marriage. 
What's the way that I should act? And the specific question here is with divorce. Is it lawful to divorce? And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't answer him with just kind of a yes or no question. He doesn't say yes because of this or no because of that. What Jesus does is he goes back to the principle behind the question that they're asking, which is what is marriage in the first place? Right? Look at me. What, isn't that what Jesus does? He, being Jesus, answered, Have you not read? <laughs> Have you not read that he created them from the beginning? Uh, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Okay, so let's just pause there. What does Jesus do? The first thing he does is what I'm exhorting us to do this morning. He says, Have you not read? What's that meant to do? Uh, what does the Bible say, Pharisees? What does the scripture say? Have you not read? Go back to the source. Go back to the root. Be hungry to know what God has to say about this. He's trying to cultivate this desire to go back to what God says. And he doesn't just say yes or no. He lays out a principle. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And then what does he do? He lays out what marriage is. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is just masterful. This is masterful. In a, in a super concise way, he answers their question in a way that they don't expect. The Pharisees are probably trying to trap him here, saying, if you say, yeah, we can divorce our wives, you, you know, then uh, it seems like you are uh, lessening. They, they know Jesus' stance on marriage. They know God hates divorce. They kind of know what he's going to say. And yet, if he says, no, you can't, they're going to say, well, then you don't believe the law because in the law of Moses, it says that we can, right? They're probably trying to trap him. And what Jesus does is he says, if you, you want to know how to act in marriage, and this is how it would apply to all of us here this morning. You really want to know how to, how to have a good marriage, how you should act in marriage, then you need to go all the way back to the foundation and you need to re-ask the question, what is a marriage? And this is probably more important for us to investigate than any, any, any time before. I'm tempted to say, get out a piece of paper and have each of you write down your definition of marriage and then fold it up and put, I, I would love to read that. What is marriage? Seriously, stop and ask yourself, what is it? If we don't know what marriage is, what God's made it to be, then there, we have no hope of being able to walk in his ways and obeying how we're, how we're supposed to obey what marriage is. We have no hope of living and walking in the way that God's called us to, to walk if we don't know what it is, which is what Jesus is saying here. If you don't understand how God made it and what he made it to be and what he made it for, then you're going to make the wrong decisions. And that we know is, uh, is profoundly costly. Right? Like if you go and you read some of the Proverbs, so the, what, one of the things that the Proverbs lay out is, and remember, ladies, the Proverbs is written to a man. Okay? It, it's a father writing to his son. Okay? So regularly, what you see in the Proverbs is if you marry the wrong kind of woman, your life is going to be a, a sad day, buddy. Right? Marrying a quarrelsome woman is, is like going out into the desert to die. <laughs> Marrying a, a nagging wife is like uh, drips of water dropping. He says at one point uh, that a, a, a good wife, a wife of prudence, is a, like a crown on your head, but a bad wife is rottenness in your bones, is what he says in the Proverbs. And we all kind of know this, don't we? Like, I'm just trying to raise the stakes for us here. This is a big deal stuff. This is big boy stuff, right? You make a mistake with the person that you marry, and what God's Word says is you're going to have a really, really hard life, or you don't know how to live and how to act in marriage. You're going to have an incredibly difficult life, is what it's saying here. And we, and we all kind of know this, don't we? Like, unfortunately, my guess is almost everybody in this room can draw an image in their mind of an awful marriage right now. Whether that's a friend of yours, whether that's your own parents, uh, I have probably most of us, we, we can bring that to mind right now. We don't, you don't, you, you, you've tasted firsthand how horribly it goes for you when you don't do marriage right. You know, I, I remember I used to even think, as a young man, I, I used to think everybody's marriage is horrible <laughs> behind closed doors. And they just smile when they're outside of the doors. Anybody, can anybody relate to that? Like, I, I just thought, like, before I was in the church, before I was a Christian, I just thought, that's just normal. That's just what it is, you know? That's just how, I, I, I just, I'm trying to make a point of how pervasive it is that our marriages are not the way they ought to be. And part of the reason because it is that way is because we've defined what marriage is wrongly. 
I think one of the really interesting things to study is if you go and you study Obergefell. If you don't know what Obergefell is, it was a law, it was a court decision that um, granted same-sex marriage. Uh, it said same-sex marriage is a legitimate marriage. And the reason why they were able to grant that, the reason why Obergefell came into law is because they redefined what marriage is. Marriage, throughout most of uh, our history, it's been granted uh, because our society really is built on the foundation of God's word. It really has been believed that marriage is between a man and a woman. Why? Because Jesus says it is. He created them male and female, and a man shall leave his father and hold and his mother and hold fast to his wife, right? And then what happened with Obergefell, in order to reorient and reset, and it's okay for a man and a woman to, or a man and a man or a woman and a woman to get married. What they did, if you go and you read, is they basically redefine marriage to say marriage is, and here's my fear, most of us, uh, I have a thin Christian veneer over this defini of definition of marriage. Marriage is a, a, a publicly supported and endorsed uh, relationship based on mutual emotions and commitment. Okay? Does that mean that, that's, that's a rough sketch of what Obergefell said was the definition of marriage. Uh, here's, I'm going to say it one more time. It's a, it's a public affirmation, a public acknowledgement, a public declaration of a, a commitment and friendship. Here's the problem with that. If that's what marriage is, if that's all that marriage is, okay, then uh, th there's nothing unique about marriage from your roommates. Right? Like, that's a friendship. You're committed. You're in a house together. You love each other. Let, go call that a marriage. <laughs> and yet we all know that. No, that's not a marriage. And here's the problem. Guys, what's at stake here? is more than just our definition of marriage so we can hold on to our traditional values about, oh, who really cares? Let people, as long as they're not hurting anybody, right? What's at stake here is massively more important than that. A, what's at stake here is if you redefine marriage, then you won't know how to live within a marriage and you're probably not gonna have a good marriage, okay? But B, the bigger thing almost that's at stake here is when we redefine marriage, uh, what happens is, is the children suffer. The children suffer. If you go and you do any kind of research for five minutes, just type in statistics on single parent households, you will find shocking and devastating statistics about what happens to children that are in single parent households. Okay, mentally, they, 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 they don't perform as well, right, as far as they're uh, more likely to be in prison, more likely uh, to be on, more likely to be on the welfare state, right? And it's not just with a single parent home, it's actually, if it's not two biological parents. Sometimes you can overcome this with adoption, sometimes you can overcome this with single moms, they can work really hard and God can bless it. I'm not saying if you're a single mom, it's just hopeless, or if you've adopted somebody, it's hopeless, but in general, you go read the statistics, and even the secular sociology professors, what they're saying is if we had to just pick an ideal, we would come up with something similar to the two-parent home. When you don't have two biological parents in the home, it's just, it's just clear. Everybody acknowledges it. The children suffer. And then what happens when the children suffer is the state comes in and gets involved, right? It costs money for someone to be in prison. It costs money for someone to be in the foster care system. It costs money for them to be on the health care program. It's expensive, and the entire uh, population feels that. And when we erode the definition of marriage so that we don't know how to be in a marriage and we don't know what a marriage is and we raise these kids in this way that wasn't according to God's word, what you will see 100% of the time is the society itself deteriorate. And so when we fight for the definition of marriage in God's word, we're not just saying we think that's gross and we don't like it. We have an animus towards it. We don't, we don't feel good about it. We are actually fighting for our very neighbors. We're fighting for their children. We're fighting for our society, so to speak. Does that make sense? This is not just like a political hobby horse here. What we need to do, beginning with the church, is we need to, just like the Israelites that were in Babylon, humble ourselves and say, oh God, we've tried to go our own way. We've tried to do our own thing. We've tried to make our own definitions. We've tried to worship however we want to worship. And God, here we are in Babylon. Things are going horribly wrong. And, and what we need to do is we need to repent. And we need to be the kind of people that just say, okay, God, what does your word say? And that's what I'm going to do. 
And so all I want to accomplish this morning, all I want to accomplish is to get a biblical definition of marriage. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about divorce, talk a little bit about one aspect of marriage. And then the, the next four, what we're going to do is we're going to go more specifically through some of, those defini- some of those aspects of marriage and what it looks like to live faithfully in those. If this is what marriage is, then this is how I live, okay? And then uh, specifically, what does it look like for men in marriage? And what does it specifically look like for women in marriage, okay? So the, the next two will be, uh, specific aspects of marriage and how to live, and then the following two after that, or, or be gender specific, uh, how, do, how do men live and how do women live within a marriage. And so I'm really thankful for Christ. Uh, let's look at uh, Christ's definition of marriage here. If we're gonna, if we're gonna live rightly, w- w- what does Jesus say? Let's just, what does Jesus say? Look at me at verse five. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Okay, so principle number one, what is a Christian marriage? A Christian marriage is something that takes uh, priority in your life. What Jesus is saying here is not just how you should act in a marriage. This is really important. He's actually saying something about what marriage is here, okay? He's saying that a marriage is more fundamental to your life than the relationship between a parent and a child. Do you see that? Do you see that in the text? What he's as, as fundamental, as intimate, as important as the relationship between a parent and a child is, the relationship between a husband and a wife is more important, more fundamental, more central to your life. And you can see that because he says you should leave your father and mother and you should hold fast to your wife. If we understand this, if we understand, okay, that's what marriage is. As far as earthly relationships go, it's number one. It's at the top. It's my most important marriage, or most important relationship. If we understand that's what it is, then suddenly our relationship gets an incredibly high value. It is exclusive. It is valuable. It is the thing that we devote our time and our energy and our attention to. When we understand that, it helps us to know how do we set boundaries in our work? How do we set boundaries with our parents? You know, there's almost nothing more, uh, um, that might be dramatic, but it's really tragic when you see a mom or a dad that's unwilling to let go and let their kid be married. Because you know what they're doing there? They're, They're saying, I want my relationship with you, sweetheart, to be more important than your relationship with your spouse. And when you do that, you absolutely submarine all their happiness. It is one of the most selfish things a parent can do. Even though on the outside, it looks really selfless, right? It looks like they just really love their kid. If you do not make your marriage the priority so that it's more important even than a father-son or father-daughter or a mother-son, mother-daughter relationship, then you don't have a biblical definition of marriage. And what you'll end up doing is you'll cheapen it. You'll cheapen it, right? And when you cheapen it, what you'll do is you'll despise it. When a marriage becomes cheap, it's easy to get out. You uh, have a polygamous or multiple open relationship. What what that's basically saying is this is not an exclusive, high-value, priority relationship. I give this priority to many other people. What happens is your marriage becomes incredibly cheap. It becomes easy to get out of it. It's a small thing to leave. And what we see is the fruit of that definition, as we see in Obergefell, is massive divorce. Massive divorce, a belittling of our spouses. We don't value them highly. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, what's the second thing? Number one, a marriage, uh, review, number one, a marriage, it's between a male and a female. Number two, um, what is a marriage? A marriage is your priority relationships. It's, it's, it's the most important relationship in your life. Your marriage goes bad. It doesn't matter what your other relationships are like. You're in trouble. And the two shall become one flesh is what he says in the second half of five. What is this saying? What does this mean? I think it does mean sex. I think it's part of what it means, okay? But it's certainly not all it means, okay? The two shall physically become one flesh, but, but what Jesus is talking about here is you have two people, and then when they come together in marriage, that they become a third thing. They become a, a, a new person, right? I, I think about this. It's, it's almost like when I say Kenan and Ada, <laughs> It's almost like I'm saying one person. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's Keenan and Nada's car, or Keenan and Nada's house, or I love how Keenan and Nada do this, or they do that, or they, oh, Keenan and Nada are so good at this, right? It's almost like it's a third name. You've got Keenan and Nada, and you've got Keenan and Nada, you know? Like, or Chad and Nicolette, or John and Becca, or Dan and Paula, right? Steve and Vicky. When, like, have you guys ever noticed that this is kind of a joke? I, I, I don't know. I wonder if there's something to this. Like, married couples, people say at the longer you're married, you start to look like each other. Have you guys ever seen that? You notice that? 
I wonder if that's not so much like a physical phenomena. I wonder if that's a sociological, psychological phenomena where you're starting to think about them as one unit. And so you start to almost see them as one unit. I wonder if that's what's happening. When you get married, there's such a profound intimacy. What the scripture says is that it's like you're one person now. It's like you used to be this and this, and a chemical reaction has happened to where you're a third compound now, right? Now, salt is not sodium. Salt is not chloride. Both of those things on their own are pretty crazy chemical compounds. You mix it together, sodium chloride, that's something that you can eat every day. You, you know, it's third. It's totally different, and so it is with the marriage. There ought to be such an intimacy, what the scripture is saying here. There ought to be such an incredible intimacy that, that you become one person. In fact, Ephesians says that it, it's as if when you care for your wife, you're caring for your own flesh. Oh man, I'm so excited to talk about this. I'm having to hold my, I, want, I just want to dive in. Um, just one thing. So here's what this means. Here, here's what, this is, so, this is so hard and good. When you get married, if you have a biblical definition of marriage, that you're going to be so intimate that you're one flesh, what that means is you are opening yourself up to your partner to see everything in your life, physically and spiritually, and to change it. Wait, change it? What? Like, here's what we want to do in this culture. When we define marriage the way Obergefell defined it, what we want to do, we want to hang on to our independence. We want to hang on to who we are. We don't want to get swallowed up. Oh, I got to maintain me. I can't let this person get too close to whether change me, right? And what we do is we cut marriage at the nerve when we do that. We don't allow for intimacy when we hang on to our independence. And it's because we're so afraid of them coming in and changing us. But don't you change your own body? Like you stand in the mirror and what do you do? You see a hair you don't like and you pluck it. You see some fat that maybe you don't like, it seems unseemly, and what do you do? You try to get rid of it. You, you take showers, you get the dirt off of your body, you take care of your body, you change your body into be what it ought to be. And when you get married, what he's saying is you're so profoundly intimate that the other person, you're opening them up to say, hey, uh, uh, that, this thing in your life, it, it's gotta go. You know what I mean? It's gotta go. That hair, it's gotta be plucked. You're so intimately known by each other. You're opening each other up to, to be changed by each other. And that is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying, isn't it? But that's what marriage is. It's so intimate that you become one flesh. You open yourself up to be taken care of like somebody takes care of their flesh. And what are some of the implications of this? Third, what does Jesus say? It's, it, it is your priority. It's profoundly intimate. And it's lifelong between a man and a woman. So, verse 6, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It's lifelong. Jesus is saying from the beginning, when, he, when God made marriage, he intended it to be a lifelong covenant relationship. And here's the problem, guys. You cannot do any of the other things. You can't be intimate. You can't have profound friendship where you know each other on such a deep level that you become one. You, it, we all crave that, right? We all hunger and thirst for that kind of intimacy, and it cannot happen apart from the safety of a marriage relationship that actually means it when it says, till death do us part. It just can't happen. Where there's not that level of safety, where you look that other person in the eye and you say, whatever you find in my heart, whatever depths of darkness or sin, however much it costs you to make me the priority in your life, that you're going to value me, you're going to make me the most, even if it's expensive and it means sacrificing your goals or sacrificing some of your relationship with your family, sacrificing relationship with your friends. It's too hard. It's too expensive. It's too difficult. If you don't have this umbrella, this powerful thing overhead protecting you to where you say uh, what man is joined together, let not man separate. If you don't take this with dead seriousness, you won't be able to be intimate. You'll be scared. You'll be scared to show your heart to somebody. You'll say, if they see who I am, they're just going to leave. If they really know the real me, they're going to leave. And so I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to put it on and you'll never know a true biblical marriage. Y your marriage will be difficult and painful and horrible. It'll be hard, right? Y you'll act and wonder why they're feeling that way and acting that way because they haven't been honest with you. They're putting on this mask. They don't believe that they can show you who they really are. They'll be afraid to invest in the relationship the way they ought to. Jesus says it should be your primary relationship. You just spend and spend and spend and spend and spend time, money, energy on this marriage. And if you don't have a strong degree that it's going to endure, 
it's going to be really, really, really difficult to invest into that relationship. Does that make sense? If in the back of your mind you're thinking we're probably going to get a divorce, I promise you, you're not going to have a biblical uh, life as far as investing in this relationship. It's just, it's not going to work. And so if we're going to have a relationship like this, we have to have such a profound understanding of the lifelongness of this commitment that we have uh, just a, a deep and profound saying, I will not divorce you, whatever happens, come hell or high water. And that's what Jesus tries to do in the rest of this section. Look with me, let's read the rest of it. Verse seven, they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? The Pharisees, they're fighting for their right to divorce. They're fighting for their right to break up and leave their wives. And it seems like this was something that was happening fairly regularly in the Jewish uh, population, that the men were sending their wives away, that whenever they would find a defect in their wives, something they didn't like, they would use that as an excuse to send them away. Malachi has a lot to say about that, if you're ever interested. We'll get there but in this series, but not, not this morning. And what does Jesus say to them? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying you get married to someone, you say those vows, and they do something that you don't like, and you say, okay, I'm leaving you, I'm divorcing you, it's over. You can give them that paper of divorce, and that does not mean that you're divorced in God's eyes. And if you go and you get remarried, God considers that remarriage adultery because in his mind, you're still married to the wife of your youth. Like this oneness that we're talking about in marriage is so profound and so powerful with a portion of his spirit that it's not something that you can just easily divide asunder with a piece of paper and say, okay, now I'm free to go marry whoever I want. That's insane, guys. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying this marriage relationship is more permanent than you think. So that even if you marry somebody and then later on you want to get a divorce, there's a sense in which it's permanent in the eyes of God. Now, there's some debate about how to understand this sexual immorality clause. Some people say that this is called the exception clause, and it means that you are free to divorce and remarry if, if there's been sexual immorality. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not so clear to me, though, that that's the real indication of what this means. In Matthew, earlier, what Jesus says is he says, if you, uh, except for adultery, if you divorce your wife and remarry, you cause her to commit a sexual immorality. You cause her to commit adultery. And so in that time, a, a wife that's, a, a girl that's single, she can't live. She has to remarry, okay? And so he's saying, if you divorce her, she's going to have to get remarried, and you're making her commit adultery because in my mind, she's still married to you. And so if she commits adultery, then you're not forcing her to commit adultery. She already did it, right? But still, it, it doesn't mean it's just this get out of marriage free card. They committed sexual immorality. They committed adultery. Great, I'm off the hook, Right? Because our marriages are meant to reflect Christ. They're meant to reflect who God is. God hates divorce. And you go and you read the Old Testament, and what God says over and over and over again is that Israel was unfaithful to him. A horrible bride that didn't respect him, didn't love him, went and slept with other people over and over and over again. He says, Israel, you're like a prostitute. That's what you're like. And yet I continue to bring you back and to love you again and again and again and again. And if that's our image of marriage, if that's what we're imitating in our marriage, then what we do is we're saying, uh, however difficult your marriage is, the more opportunity you have to be like Christ in it. Does that make sense? I'm going to say that again. Is your marriage difficult? Is it hard? Is it a mess? Staying in it and continuing to love your wife then is an opportunity for you to be more like Christ who loved the church at profound cost to himself. Does that make sense? Guys, whatever Jesus said to the disciples, <laughs> this, like this is actually kind of funny. Look at me at verse 10. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> if I can't divorce somebody, I'm not even getting married, dude, right? Like if, I, if I'm going to commit adultery, like I'm, I'm out. That's insane. Whatever Jesus said to them so terrified them that their new understanding of marriage was, okay, if there's even a chance that I'm going to get a divorce, it's better for me not to get married. And Jesus doesn't tell them he's wrong. He says, hey, if you can handle that, great. Now, most people can't handle that. Most people are not okay with a life of singleness. 
God gives us a sex drive. He gives us this desire for intimacy. He gives us these things and it drives us into this incredibly difficult relationship and we're locked in in God's eyes and we have to figure it out and we have to work it out. And when we're locked in, even when it's painful and difficult and we're not happy, that's where God transforms us. That's where the grace of God shows up. That's where you have to humble yourself and repent of your sin. That's where you have to say, I've been wrong and I need to look more like Christ. That's where God goes to work within the confines of that covenant relationship. And so here's what I'm eager for us as a church. Here's what I'm eager for us to do. I'm eager for us to be the kind of people that say, okay, whatever God's word says is marriage. That's how I'm going to live. That's how I'm going to act. And here's what we're going to find. We are unable to do it. We're absolutely unable to do it apart from the power of God in our lives, a profound understanding of the gospel, a deep understanding of his love for us and that foundational truth that we are in Christ and eternity is our future and that we're living for him and we know him and this life is a blink. We're going to have to be the kind of people, the ch kind of church, if we're going to have strong marriages that know the gospel deeply and that are looking to God's word and just saying, I just want to obey what you have to say. Would you help me? Would you help me? Would you help me? And here's what's amazing about that, guys. It, it might be really, really difficult, probably more difficult than you think. But I think, I think I'm right in saying this. I think wisdom is born by, uh, born, uh, you see the fruit of wisdom by her children. If we will be the kind of people, if we will be the kind of people that just do marriage God's way, we submit to him, we follow him, we love him, we ask him for help, we trust him, we strive after godliness. I think, I hope that what we'll see is 20 years down the road, we look back and we're just in awe at what God did in our marriages that they're full of joy, that they're intimate, that we're one flesh, that we know and we love each other. They're full of joy that God used that to raise godly offspring in our lives and we just weep for joy at what God did in our lives. And if we fail to do this as a church, we should take heed to what the Proverbs say, right? That a bad marriage is rottenness in your bones. Listen, if you've gotten off track, or, or maybe if you just haven't had a biblical definition of marriage and you're not married yet, then praise God for this series. Now's the time to get on track and it could radically change literally the rest of your life. You get your marriage relationship right and you can handle an onslaught from the rest of the world. You can handle some intense, deep, dark stuff if you've got your wife and you've got your husband and you know that you are together in the battle. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. If you know Christ and if you know your wife and if you're together in God's way, that you can handle much more than you think you can. And so here's my prayer. Here's my hope that we as a church, we would say, okay, God, what do you say? How do I live it? How do I obey it? And then we just beg, to him, beg, beg for him to help us. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you teach us what marriage is supposed to be. And God, we just humble ourselves and we, we repent. God, we're sorry for how we've thought about marriage as something that's for our emotional well-being. It's just something for us to feel good about. It's just something for us to uh, be happy about and, and like. And uh, Lord, we, we just confess, we repent. Lord, um, marriage is what you've called it to be. It's what you've made it to be. And Lord, we just confess that you know how the world works better than we do. And so Lord, we pray that you'd give us wisdom to know how to live it, how to walk in it. God, that we wouldn't just compare ourselves to the world and think we're doing great. But Lord, I pray that we compare ourselves to your word, that we'd look in the mirror of your word and that we would go home, and that we would seek to obey. Help us, Lord. We love you. We thank you that you're eager to do this. God, I just think you're with us in this battle. You're with us in this uh, endeavor to have godly marriages. I think you're, uh, you, you hate divorce, God. You want us to have godly marriages. You desire godly offspring. And so, Lord, I just believe that you'll help us. And I thank you, Lord. Amen.